so welcome everybody. I'm going to talk to you about uh, financial domain specific languages. It sounds very complicated, but actually maybe it isn't so. So I will start with a hook. You all signed a banking contract when you opened your account with a bank. So my contract looks like this. It's dozens of pages. Uh, thanks God it's in English. Many, some banks have it in French. So my question to you is, did you read it? <laughs> really? <laughs> so there are multiple reasons why you didn't. So first of all, it is long. So second of all, it is way, way too long, like impossible. It is written using a specialized vocabulary. Uh, the sentence structure is complex and just generally speaking, it is not written for human beings. It's written for lawyers, for finance people, not for you and me. So how can we improve this situation? So maybe computers can help us understand contracts. So, okay, finance is a complicated subject, but maybe computers can help. But the computers can only help if they understand the language. It is hard for a, for a computer to understand the natural language like your banking contract is written in. So we want to improve that. Let's talk about computer languages. Uh, so what are the properties of computer languages? They are precise. Contrary to a natural language where every word has some shades of meaning, which is dependent on the speaker and the listener, computer languages are precise. Every word has a strict definition, a clear semantics. They are well structured and uh, as a consequence, they are machine readable. That is, computers can read this text and make sense of it, build some models, do some computations, and help us understand what's in there. Uh, when I'm speaking about computer languages, I don't only mean programming languages. So, for instance, there are such things as markup languages. For example, HTML, which is a language that describes how a simple web page looks like. Uh, and other kinds of languages are modeling languages that model relationships between some objects. And they are used, for example, in the industries to model complicated relationships between some industrial equipment or some kind of these things. And of course, there are programming languages that are used to model computation. Uh, for example, Java or Python or C++, you may be familiar with some of these languages. Uh, so if we're talking about financial domain, what are these objects that we're trying to model? We are talking about accounts, uh, transactions that transfer some amount of money from one account to another, and contracts. So let's talk about what a contract actually is. Uh, so a contract actually is something that defines uh, who gets what and when. Uh, a contract is nothing more than a set of transactions in the present or in the future. Uh, we have to define who pays whom and how much money, of course, when does a transaction takes, takes place, and under what conditions. For example, if you get a loan from the bank, that is a series of transactions. First, the bank gives you some money, and then you have to repay it back with some interest with a series of transactions in the future. And if you break the contract, there will be some sanctions or fees or something like that. That is actually uh, all that is written in these contracts. So a naive approach to modeling financial um, a financial domain in computer languages is what is called an imperative paradigm. An imperative paradigm is the, um, uh, is the model of language where we describe how a computer should proceed, what exactly a computer should do to calculate what we want it to calculate. Uh, but it is very easy to forget some corner case. It's very easy to uh, do something wrong and it turns out that for computers it's rather hard to automatically reason about programs that are written using an imperative language. So contrary to that approach, a possibly better approach is called, ah, sorry, I forgot about the example. Uh, so here's the example of a simple contract written imperatively. If today is the 1st of January 2018, send $100 from X to Y. So a computer should look at the current date, compare it to the 1st of January 2018, and based on the results of this comparison, do something or not do anything. So a possibly better approach is called a declarative approach. Uh, we describe what we want to achieve at the end and let the computer come to that result. So of course, all the logic 
must be implemented somewhere on the lower level maybe, but the main point is that the programmer should not care about how the computer calculates the result. The programmer just describes very precisely what it is that we want to achieve. Uh, the main point is that we want to, um, uh, to combine, we want to define a small set of very primitive building blocks. The semantics of each building block is clear because it's small and simple. And then we combine them, potentially indefinitely deep, to construct new contracts, new complicated structures. So here are some examples of declarative contracts in a language that, um, that I and my colleagues have been doing research uh, in, in this area. So the, the simplest contract, the simplest building block, looks like this. It means transfer one dollar from here to there. So we assume that the parties are implicit here, so there is some Alice and Bob, two parties of this contract, and this contract transfers one dollar from Alice to Bob. So what happens if we want to do the reverse? We can apply what is called a give modifier. Uh, that actually means reverse all payments in the underlying contract. And as you see, the one contract is the building block inside the give contract. So another example, what, we want, uh, what if we want to send $100? We apply the scale modifier, a modifier with the parameter 100. That means all the payments in the underlying contract, which is one here, will be multiplied by 100. Uh, more complicated example, we can, uh, on top of what we have already built, we add a temporal, uh, a temporal clause and execute it only when the year is 2018. And we can give a name to this thing, we call it C, to simplify the following. Uh, and the following is a combination of two contracts. So we take this C contract, we wrap it into give so that the payment goes in the opposite direction and we combine it with a scaled contract that transfer 90 British pounds from Alice to Bob. So what we have here actually is a simultaneous transfer of $100 in one direction and 90 British pounds into other direction and it actually is a contract that describes a simple currency exchange. So that's an example of a contract that we're trying to build. So. Uh, our contribution, uh, so what I have described is a part of contribution um, uh, that we made with our colleagues in our recent paper. In our paper we combined uh, um, a previously studied uh, declarative approach to modern financial contracts and applied it to an execution platform on the blockchain environment. Uh, that is the thing I've been talking about previously, decentralized network of computers that execute programs without the need of a trusted third party. So it's another uh, aspect of our work. And the conclusion that we come to is that declarative languages for financial applications is actually a good idea. The, the contracts uh, can be formulated very uh, concisely, clearly, and um, are well suited for, um, for computers to, to process to calculate some properties, and if we combine it with the trustless execution environment on top of blockchain, it becomes even better. So these are the uh, references. The first one is the, is the um, uh, breakthrough paper in uh, domain-specific languages that we, are that we are based upon, and the second one is our paper uh, that we just recently wrote, and I will be presenting it on the conference in just a couple of days. So thank you, I uh, can answer your questions.